Hi, it's so good to see all of you here. Wow, what a, what an extraordinary pleasure and joy to be here with you. Um, before we start, I'd like to ask everyone to join me in taking some deep breaths, because I think that is in order. So if you would like to join me, I'm going to close your mouth, take a deep breath through your nose. Um, it's such an honor to be here with our incredible uh, authors. Um, this is an event that Roxanne Gay and I have curated and done together since 2009. It started as a literary series. Very flippantly, we're like, let's do something that's feminist as fuck at the AWP, uh, AWP conference, which is the um, Association of Writing and Writing Programs conference. And it became this thing that we loved so much, showcasing some of the bravest, boldest, most talented writers um, feminist writers writing today. And so uh, I'm going to read a little thing. Roxanne couldn't be here. She's at the Texas Book Festival. Um, and she wrote this uh, to be shared with you all today. She said, hello, feminists and other friends. There better not be other friends here. You can get the fuck out. I'm sorry I cannot be with you this weekend, though, um, because I am in Austin at the Texas Book Festival, but my heart is in Los Angeles. I love curating this series with Amber Tamblin, who is an extraordinary writer, poet, activist, and person, and her suit looks particularly banging today. <laughs> we get to share the stage with bold, brilliant, feminist as fuck women, and this year is no exception. Today, you will hear from Gabrielle Bellot, who brings her unique voice to prescient observations about the ways we live our lives, and is currently working on multiple books one of which she's developing with Roxanne, I should say, on psychedelics. I cannot wait to read that. Aro Kwan brings a sharp edge to everything she writes and is so beguiling with her words, they cut like a knife. She's the author of the national best-selling groundbreaking novel, The Incendiaries, and her next book, Exhibit, is out next year in May. I cannot wait to read it. Wait to read it. Nafisa Thompson Spires who is wildly imaginative and has a keen understanding of the human condition. She is the author of the critically acclaimed National Book Award nominated collection of short stories, one of my personal favorite books, The Heads of Color People, and is currently working on a new novel, of which I think we're gonna get to hear maybe a little snippet of today. And Kirsten, Va Kirsten Vangness, who needs no introduction, is not only a talented actor and charming human, Roxanne's words, she is witty and passionate, also Roxanne's words, genuine and a generous and fabulous writer of television and theater. Amber and I hope you enjoy these women's work as much as we do, and thanks so much for joining us at Feminist as Fuck. I'm gonna read a short piece here, and then we're gonna do this little round robin style where um, Gabrielle's gonna come up and we're just gonna read. This is called Letter to Our Childhood Dreams. Authorities and the staff at the zoo are baffled by the animal cut completely in two at the torso, its lower half unmoving and deceased. The upper half of my body washes up on a beach right next to my mother's stolen jewelry. There you are, I whisper, my fur covered in the coffins of oysters fangs gnawing at the clutched cubes of rubies drizzled in the sand. I dream of wolves, I say. I will grow up to be a wolf, I dream. I will grow up to be a maze, not a labyrinth. I will grow up to be a parallel sun, scorching fire through all the masses of masculinity. I will grow up to be a success story read to your children at night. I will win all of the awards. I will grow up to be every weapon on the market, dangerous, callous, ruthless, unladylike, ambitious, cruel, ugly on the inside and out. I will grow up to dream like the dreams of men, to daydream of them, what they expect from wolves like me. I will grow up to be a man's wife, I will grow up to have an affair with a man's wife. I will get pregnant with her child. All the men will be so confused. 
It's a wolf thing, we'll say. I can breastfeed with my eyes. What can you do, men? War? Good for you and your wars. We own the moon. What the fuck do you own? I will dream my worst fears all run into rivers of my father's remaining years. He will be reborn as an ocean. I'll remember all that I lost and all that's been found in his waves. I will grow up to be a little girl forever. I will grow up to be unafraid of my father's ending. I will grow up to understand that the weavings of my dreams are not real until a single thread undoes itself. You might wonder why I don't bother to mention my mother in this letter. I will address that later. Did you think this was a poem, dear reader? I will address that later. You probably wonder how I carry all my books, my dynamite, my threats, my swords, my venom, my brass knuckle pattern pantsuit, and all my endangered pet panthers in this tiny purse. I'll address that later. I will grow up to remain a little girl, I say. I grow up to become a child, I dream. Or maybe, or maybe, maybe I will grow up to stay alone. Maybe I will have lived the wrong life. I will have kissed too many magicless mouths. I will have not done enough that I could to obtain good seats to an Adele concert. I will be afraid that I was never a wolf. Are you afraid you were never a wolf? Are you lost between the you that is you, the you that is them, or the you that is true? Are you afraid of what will gleam back? When you grow up, will you stand quiet while rising temperatures tighten their grip around the world's lungs? Or will the white you stand quiet as injustice reigns? When you grow up, will you be complacent or complicit? Will you howl then? Will you travel in packs and feed the hungry muzzles of other women like you? Will you or won't you? Will you be a better actress than all the liars that came before you? Will you return all the dresses you've stolen from the mind of the man who does not love you? Are you an object? Are you 30 years old and completely fucking lost? Are you younger and completely lost? Are you a wise woman and completely lost? Are you completely lost with your shit together? Completely lost and reborn? Are you a completely lost priest or writer or veterinarian? Are you even a woman yet? Are you sure you're a wolf? Are you as scared as I am? Do you want to be loved deeper than the language of what you've been given? Do you want to be understood? Are all the mothers disappearing inside us? Can I cry with you now? Will you think less of me? In my dreams and in my life, my mother is the only wolf. My mother is the only wolf. Through her soft jaw, I slipped into life, a puddle of marble drenched by my father's hands. I am the only animal, my mother screamed. And all the animals came out of the woods, she dreamed. All the animals except one. The doctors were baffled. The authorities are baffled. The White House is baffled. The zoo staff is baffled. Pianists are baffled. Eyewitnesses are baffled. Tom Brokaw is baffled. All your sons are baffled by the animal cut in two at the torso, its lower half unmoving and deceased. The upper half of my body washes up on a beach right next to my mother's stolen jewelry. I cradle them just as she's cradled me, each stone a daughter that will someday go. And I let it all go out into the water, my father the sea, my mother the wolf. There you are, I whisper to the dark, that's been waiting for me to become it. Here I am, it whispers back.
Uh, thank you all of you for taking time to be with us here today. Uh, this is a short piece uh, from my essay collection. Always, always, the men stare as I go by on my motorbike. A midnight blue Vespa that glitters in the light like stardust. My helmet white with pink curly cues along its sides and a reflective magenta visor. And when I say the men stare as I go by, I mean they stare. I mean a long, lingering, unpunctuated stare. Lord, their necks craning like fish on a twisting line, their expressions flat as if they have encountered in me a thing they do, do not understand. And to be fair, I am such a thing as I go by, rippling the stagnant pools of their eyes. Because the people who ride the motorcycles and scooters here and almost everywhere are predominantly men. Those oh-so-manly men who need to rev loud and go fast and forego helmets or safety gear to show you just how manly they are. And don't get me started on the men in the cars I pass. The ones who seem to have an existential crisis when I gently overtake them. The ones who rush with caterwauling tires into the lane of traffic going the opposite way just to try to pass me because I cannot be in front of them for a second. Lord, so manly. <laughs> I pause to take a breath. I'm at a light on Northern Boulevard in Long Island City in New York, a route near my home. In some ways, it feels like all the sounds of NYC at once. A blaring horn, the soft whir of a man on an electric unicycle blowing through a red light, incomprehensible yelling, the signature rumble of a subway train. On either side of the street, there are clusters of people milling about, waiting for when it's safe to jaywalk, the other signature of NYC. But it's the men I notice most. They don't stare the whole time. Instead, it's the furtive glances that linger, the ones you feel even before looking back. It's the kind of thing I feel when a man in a car nearby blows me a kiss when my visor is up. It's what I feel when a man in Manhattan walks up to me as I park one afternoon, looking me and my bike up and down, saying my bike is sexy and asking if I can give him a ride. Bike or booty, he never clarifies. <laughs> At this light, I feel them gazing, grinning, wandering by the firelight of an old world. Sometimes as I pause, I try to see myself through the men's eyes. I get it, you know. The trope of the motorcycle is of men in action movies, male outlaws, white male freedom to go anywhere unobstructed. Then there's me, woman at a glance, on a large frame 300cc scooter that can go 80 miles an hour and that sometimes does go that fast along the glorious wild rumpus of the highways. My leather jacket is dark and scuffed, gloves black pink, helmet bright in its visor and design. Stylistic choices I've made just because I like them. And because, if I'm being honest, I kind of want the starers to suspect I am a lady. Want them to know intimately just who left them in the dust of their toxicity so that they may start to ask themselves why it mattered to beat me in a race at all. <laughs> why they assumed motorbikes, including my Vespa, should have a male rider as their default. Never mind, of course, the gentle ironies that historically, scooters like the Vespa emerged after the devastation of the Second World War with skirt or dress wearing women in mind. Their elegant bit of legroom making it easier to market the vehicle to men and women alike. An equal opportunity steed of the streets meant to help Italy's post-war recovery. Never mind either that women have been riding scooters and motorcycles for decades. 
not just as eye candy in advertisements or films, but because we wish to explore and feel the exhilaration of, of the winds as much as anyone else. Well, when it's not Sub-Zero. I don't recommend doing this when it's Sub-Zero. <laughs> There's something universal about that, isn't there? The freedom you feel on a bike, exposed to the elements, slender enough to slip through the spaces cars cannot. This dual sense of escape and escapism is why we call people in closed up cars cagers, is why even a little mouse in a beloved children's book by Beverly Clary about mice and motorcycles falls in love with the freedom of riding a toy motorbike. And though the bike has no conventional engine, it doesn't need one because the mouse makes it go simply by making a boop, a boop, a boop noise and imagining the bike going. To ride in the best moments you see is actually kind of like that. It's to enter a space of imagination, a dream pool where it is just you and the road, all else abandoned. Of course, you can only exist in the dreaming for a bit at a time. Always alert to the cars that do not see you and to the way you must shift body and bike alike when the road suddenly curves like parentheses. But those moments of abandon are worth it, where all you feel is the psychedelic wonder of a now. And as a trans woman, there's something so rare about times like that where you get to just be, rushing along without worrying for once about whether or not you pass and what the wrong man might do if he finds out you're trans and decides you must be punished for deceiving him, without worrying about what will happen when you walk into the women's restroom, without wondering why Republicans simultaneously want to ban books about sexuality and want to check everyone's genitals before they walk into any public space, the personal, of course, is political, so I am always walking on a kind of political tightrope wherever I am. But in those moments where I blaze down the road, the noise quiets down for a bit. I get to be free, like that old biker trope, except now it is my story to reweave. I hadn't thought that speed could be so tranquil, yet it is. But then the gaze, the men's gaze, the gaze interrupts the dream. I feel it especially in moments like this, when I'm stopped at one of those lights that takes forever to change, and I feel those lingering looks, whereas they only give the male bikers a fleeting glance, even the ones on loud, rumbustious bikes. Not all men, you might start to say, and obviously that is a literal truth, not all the dudes. But it's not about how many actually do the staring, uh, so much as why the staring happens in the first place. Why the men believe something is for them, of them, and strange, foreign, laughable, unserious, disruptive in the hands of another. As I wait at the light, I realize it is like we are beings in an immortal myth. How their necks seem to swivel, saurian, ancient, and we are once again around an old fire with men clad in the skins of beasts long gone, rough spears in hand, ears and eyes alert to the skitter of the creatures they know and the growl of that which they do not in the tall still grasses, the growl that could as easily portend danger as divinity. Now, millennia later, that enigma growl is my engine, and that occult thing in the grasses is me. After a while, their gazes lower. The myth has died down to an ember. The threat has softened into memory, and the earth is its modern self again. My weirdness suggested like a dial to match the weirdness of the city at large. Once again, the sun intensifies the edges of the buildings. The subway is loud. The air is stuffy. The heaviness of a magician's library. 
But even once the men look away, I still feel like I'm in that old archetypal field with that old clearing of old fire, that men, so many men, stand around, eyes on rippled pools. I am still a question that hasn't been answered, still the unbridgeable other. I still spin witter shins to their sun, still stand out like a robot performing witchcraft. In a sense, it's all meaningless. I ride and they ride, and it all works out, usually. And to be honest, I don't really want to divide them from me. I have little philosophical interest in binaries, which almost never actually capture reality. And in the cosmic scheme of things, after all, we're all part of the unbroken, leaves and lepidopterans and lingering gazers and lady bikers alike, none of us better or worse than the other. It means a lot to me to remember this basic principle, especially in an age of knee-jerk tribalism. Like a magic spell, it helps me keep going when the world becomes too much. The light changes to green. I zoom off. If I am being honest some more, though, there's also something indulgently sweet about seeing that gaze and knowing you stand out like a little marble, Vespa alchemized into the ineffable. You're weird in the best of ways. In these moments, you are briefly super califragilistic superwoman, a supernova of a super attack in a video game, super in the sense of above, in the sense of standing tall as in fuck you. It is a kind of appearance magic, a glamour of ritual and runway alike, where for a moment you are blazing forward, even if you seem to be standing still. Ultimately, I just ride for the sake of riding, art for its sake, like Walter Pater's edict. But how at home I feel in these new old, ancient modern times when a ritual is disrupted and in its flicker, I get to make a new one, just for me. Thank you. Um, thank you to Amber and to Roxanne, and thank you to the Vulture Fest. Thank you all um, for being here in this, in this hard time. It, it feels good to gather here. Um, so when years ago I first told my editor about the novel that would become Exhibit, my next novel, um, which is coming out next year, I said I couldn't say much about it yet, but that it was full of sex. Great, perfect, that's all I need to know, she said, <laughs> and we both laughed. Um, but also, in a larger sense, Exhibit is an exploration of desire and the ferocious pursuit thereof, including desires having to do with bodies, art, ambition, queer exuberance, religion, kink, origin stories, and yes, sex. With Exhibit, I was hell-bent on exploring a question I have found fascinating. Why is it that I feel so strongly pushed by the world and by people I know to want certain things, and just as strongly pushed to not want certain things? Every day of my life, I feel a great deal of pressure to want to be a very good daughter of, wife of, mother of, sister of, community member of. It's all mediated through that of. Things I feel pressured not to want, to hide my appetite for, include sex, food, artistic ambition, any ambition at all, a day alone. In other words, anything for myself. And it's important to me to be a good daughter, to be highly active in my communities, but what is so dangerous about me wanting anything for myself? And so in Exhibit, I ended up following a couple of people, a photographer and a ballerina who want a great deal, and to see what happens if they're given the space to run at full tilt after what they desire. Quick content warning, um, in the first minute of what I'll read, there is a double suicide that takes place 100 plus years ago, and it's loosely based on a family story. Please take care of yourself and feel free to skip out for this part. Um, I'll now read from the start of Exhibit. Advanced copies just landed, so this is my first time reading from this book. And uh, 
And also, wonderfully, my parents are here. Um, hi, Oma. Hi, Appa. And uh, I, I invited them to this, but trust me, Oma and Appa, um, please don't read the rest of this book. Um, <laughs> and for the rest of y'all, exhibit will, will be out in May. <laughs> One, she'd go up the tall pine first. He flung his leg on a bough close behind. She didn't slip, her leaps agile. Hanbok silk, bright, swift, flared with each jump. If cloth tangled with the sprig, he lunged to help. In the fresh light, they kept going as high as possible. His parents, upset, hadn't slept. He'd spoken the past night of his plan to wed a kizang. Startled, his parents said he must be joking. No kizang, paid to sing, jig, and flirt in public, had the right to wed a Han. Not just a Han, the prized first son, obliged to pass along his line. He'd beg pardon, then forget this whore of a girl. Instead, as I told Lydia, he replied that he loved this kissing. She'd be his wife. If you don't stop talking, his father said, I'll kill you. Lips tight, the sun left. Night lifted. Oil-polished hanji doors slid open. A maid wailed. Paired bodies hung from the pine, humboks rippling. Next breaking, they died. In my Amma's telling, this old tale proved lasting, trailing bodies, spoiled lives, and evil I'd also perhaps inherit. People said the Kisang spirit, abiding, hostile to all Hans, kept us cursed. It might be nothing, but spite held a ghost close to the living. It was best, though, not to talk of the spirit. I ought to tell future offspring, a husband, no one else, darling, Oma said. Just by talking, I'd wrestle up the Kisang's ghost. Still, it might find me, this birthright evil. I'd flag it through a wild urge to risk for a futile, single love all the ties I rated high. I had to kill this longing. If I didn't, I'd light my life on fire. I said I'd listen. For a while, I did. But that June night in Marin with Lydia, I felt this pledge's hold like hexed rope shred rip then fall philip you'll ask how i told this person i just met what i kept from you i've tried figuring it out sifting the burnt pile of all that i ignited it's true that with lydia i let go of rules by which i'd lived not long after the night in marin she fixed a gag to my face it was big spit wet the globe fell out lydia impatient applied foil tape it stayed on but left the skin she taped shining red. I had a rash, allergic. I told Philip I'd reacted to a lip balm, but if not for the lying, I'd have loved this rash. I forgot to be vain. It was put up like a sign, as though I might be hers. Irving, a friend of Philip, was sitting a place in Marin. Irving flung the door open to us. Philip, Jin, hello, you're the first people here. In the kitchen, he filled the highballs as he spoke of friends he expected, sculptors, artists, who else? I forget, the spotlight circling Lydia unrolls, this large halo, glaring like a path to the sun. I've lost what else he said until I heard of Lydia. Not Lydia with the Y, he said, citing us drinks. L-I-D-I-J-A, Lydia Jung. It's a spelling she picked at the ripe age of five after she started taking ballet lessons. With the hope of being a little more Slavic, like the dancers Lydia idolized. Five. Isn't that wild? Is that what she does? I asked. She dances? She's injured, but yes, he said. Did she quit? No, but she can't perform again until her leg's fixed. Lydia lived in New York, he said. Did Philip and I go to the ballet? Oh, well, if we had a chance to watch Lydia's dancing, we should. Lydia's rising so fast that she skipped the chord to be a soloist. She's a principal at the height. She has this fabled junk, light floating as though she's levitating. Ballet legend has it that in class, while she left, Lydia was told, stay up high. For an instant, she did. I glanced at Irving, not taking pride, as I'd expect, in this guest. No, I thought, elated, like a herald with glad tidings. Lo, the miracle is nigh. I, too, hope to see this Lydia dancing. The bell rang. Irving's guests jostled through. People dived in the pool. No sign of Lydia. In the shade of a large hat, I sat on the pool's lip. 
Philip held my legs. I burn fast, I said, to people asking when I'd get in. Moving the hat's angle, I shaded Philip too. Strips of light rippled, then slashed open, limbs flailing through bright ribbons. I went inside. It was quiet in the house. I got out the gin julep supplies Philip and I had brought. I put ice in a dish rag. Glass panels slid wide. You're Lydia, I said. Shining from a dip in the pool, Lydia, Marshall. She had long, taut posture, a neck rising tall. Upon its height, she lifted her head like a flag. I knew at first sight who she had to be. I am, she said, turning. It didn't surprise Lydia being noticed. Irving talked about a dancer named Lydia Jung, I said. I'm Jin. Lydia eyed the julep supplies I'd set out. Not going in the pool, she asked. Maybe later, I said. With a one-sided shrug, she picked up some motion. She bent her head. Dyed pale, Lydia's crown lit radiated light. Would Lydia's birth name be Lydia with a Y or Lydia with an I? Jung might be Korean. I hadn't met a lot of Korean people named Lydia. Lisa, perhaps. Elise. Lillian. The last time I was in a pool, I burned, Lydia said. I flaked skin. I had fish scales in my clothing. Can I fix you a drink? I asked. No, thank you. I had nothing else to ask. She applied lotion in thick piles. Lydia had ink, a line of script, coiling up from the striped wrap she slung on her hips. It was illegible, veiled in white liquid. I had to figure out what it said. She tipped lotion down the slope of a ridged leg. I rinsed a highball, trying not to watch. Lydia's film of lotion hid while inviting, flashing what it kept back. Injured, Lydia moved as if foreign to pain. I was used to this pool, though, Philip. It was a lifelong allure, the gloss of a bold, strong girl. I hit the ice with a rolling pin, cracking it. She had baptized herself at five with a ballet stage name. It was striking, a thrill. Lydia's brio as she applied lotion, not caring if I'd watch. But I just, I thought, studied to learn. Still no pool, Lydia asked. In a minute, I said. I don't believe you, she said. With a laugh, she glided out. Thank you so much. everyone. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you for coming. And I want to especially thank Amber and Roxanne for having me and my fellow readers. Um, it's an honor to read with you as well. I'm going to be reading from new work, which is really nerve wracking. So bear with me. Um, I've hardly, really, thank you. Um, I've only read from this twice. So um, yeah, it's my new novel. It's called The Four Wives and Five Deaths of Richard Milford. And it's about a really abusive man whose wives kill him five different ways. <laughs> and I want to especially thank R.O. because I was talking to her one night and um, I said, I just want to kill him five different ways. And she said, well, why don't you kill him five different ways? And um, she was like, I want to see it happen that way. And so I structured the book around that. Um, and each chapter is one of his five deaths now. So thank you for that. So I'm going to read. This is the very beginning. It was at the funeral, at the funeral, where we first saw all the wives and the valences of the house drew open. We had caught glimpses of at least one of the women through brief errands around Nehu for years. But now that we could examine them up close, we wanted blood and wailing. The dramas of fighting, grieving, concupiscent women fleeing themselves over Rich's examinate body. They met us instead with upturned faces and dignity, press clothing and palms. The devil beat his wife that day as Rich had beaten his. The rain pelted us, the sun pelted us, and sweat, water, mud, and dust dotted our clothing and soaked our ankles. So it was like the Lord punished us a little for coming to Ogle. There were six pallbearers, the oldest sons, such tall young men. We showed up with stuffed Cornish hens, greens, macaroni and cheese, salt potatoes, crisp fried chicken, potato salad, braised briskets, ribs, biscuits, cobbler, shortcakes, cherry cordial, cordiality, and affected pity as our self-charged admission fee for the spectacle. <laughs> we didn't like the way our children looked at theirs, not so much with natural curiosity, 
but with hunger in their eyes. We were hungry too. The Milford women had carried on all their allotted days in Nehu thus far with veiled secrecy. Yet those women, Vivian, Sophronia, Lowley, and Sybil, and their brood of children were civil, respectable, striking lined up in their plain white dresses and pants, for it was a Tuesday, along with the well-trained German shepherd who barked only once when the first handful of dirt landed on Rich's pinewood casket. And that was that. No one spoke. Rich belonged to the church of himself and had no reverend, no pastor. The women and children sang a song we did not recognize and cannot remember, led a cappella by the skinny, dark-skinned wife, Vivianne. He was buried in the ground unceremoniously. He came into the world with a bang, lived in it with lightning flashes and flared nostrils, and left it as we all do, with little jazz, a slight buzzing in the air. Maybe Jesus wept, but no one else did. And other than those initial raindrops, the whole field of the procession after the rain let up was dry as the matches Rich had once used to burn it. And here now lies Rich, death where is thy sting, dead as a doornail, like the ones used by the day laborers to ever expand the Chantilly house where he kept all those concubines. When his body turned up, swollen and stinking of gangrene, covering enough weeping welts to kill, alone, kill a man alone, but strangled and poisoned and bootmarked and missing a foot too, everyone proposed a suspect, and he brought the gaze across all of us. But first, a ghost tour through the town to which Rich brought all the spectacle. Excuse us while we alternately stomp, spit, defecate, blow our noses, cakewalk, seawalk, Charleston, Dougie, Macarena, wobble, cha-cha slide, and schmoney on Rich's grave. <laughs> Fool, disrespecting the practices of our ancestors and others, casting his sperm around like so much flotsam, jettisoning his power or his whip or his evil eye, all for what? Slide to the left. <laughs> Here was once the old jailhouse where the women spent three nights before the oldest two sons brought the bail. Here was the courthouse where the trials took place, binding our judge and the sheriff and our tax money to solve the great mystery of Rich's death and his missing foot. Here stood the gables and runs the river, where on the eve of a crescent moon, if you looked carefully, a woman shimmied over the water with crystals in her hair, and if you made eye contact with her, she would confer a blessing. The same churlish brown water where Rich used to showboat his muscles, the curve of a body that beat everything walking and sexed everything talking before he met his untimely end. Some in Nehu say Richard Aloysius Milford was born into a cursed family with a misshapen head that broke his mother and required forceps. Local lore holds that he went mad after the police found him, age 10, and his sister May, stunned by the remains of his father and mother, brain matter all over the walls and floor blood on both children's hands and feet, smeared across their faces like Rorschach blots. A horrible mess of an apparent murder-suicide, the Negro papers across the region, including the Nehu Tribune, said. Still others insist that Richie, as he was known by the uncle who took him in and brought him to Nehu, and Richie Rich, or Dick sometimes, didn't show any signs of insanity or violence until he was struck by lightning in the seventh grade while playing with the horses out in the field behind the house. Whichever oddity marked his troublesome personality, however, nearly all of us agreed in the aftermath of his death and its circumstances that he never had a chance, and the women never had much of a choice. Here stood the old schoolhouse where they built the highway through here, though they don't include it or Nehu in the black history tours with Tulsa or the other cities. Slate gray, like rich in death where he used to kiss up on Berta and fondle Miss Martha with her prim giggle and no protestations. The Malaforsythia fields behind the school never leaned right because of the fires Rich set two years in a row, though no one could ever prove it was him, despite our very own witnesses. By the time Rich was 18, he'd inherited 500 acres of his uncle's property and added new machinery to the Milford Farms. By 28, he made $60,000, 8,000 of which he kept hidden between a billfold, mattresses, and the floorboards of an attic and a reputation as a great violent man who wore his britches as high as his ego. By 1926, Rich had expanded his uncle's small empire with plenty of money and goods to support his 28 children and their six mothers, four of them his wives, two women of ill repute. By 1928, he was gone. Here was Rich Milford's and before him Mill Milford's great farm with a cotton gin and a thousand barrel oil well, 
200 heads of Angus cattle, an apple orchard, a small cider mill, and an inlet to the Arkansas River running through its 500 acres. The Milfords had come to Nehu with money from Boley and invested it in the late 1800s, luring some of our families away too, to share crop or work as roughnecks at the rig, or to farm our own piece of the promised land, or to open stores and businesses that would create a booming competitive city. But the Milfords had bought up the best land in Nehu before any of ours even scoped it out. And here is where the Chantilly house used to stand, gloating, where the women laid up with rich. We built modest one and two story houses with white wood siding and picture windows. Mill Milford had built an assuming house, neither Victorian nor colonial, but almost Baroque. The only one in Nehu of its kind and an eyesore to most of us, painted in layers like a cake with a red brick level at the base, a pink layer on the second and a powder blue one on the third and two great whipped big turrets at the top, a white beamed balcony going around all three levels, giving it the look of a Chantilly trifle. There, the mothers, as we called them when we were in a good mood, the concubines when we were sour, the wives, as those women preferred to be called, had occupied a sort of quiet fascination in Nehu for over a decade before we ever saw them all come out of the house. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to echo. Uh, thank you for having us, you and Roxanne. And I am so honored with the company that I am keeping. Um, this is something I started writing. I do a salon, actually, the street across the way on Coanga. Um, I'm a member of Theater of Note, and we do a thing called Bits there. And I had started that there. So if you ever want to come here, a bunch of weirdos read some stuff they're just making up in under nine minutes. There's one on the 30th. Um, uh, trigger warning, there's a little sex abuse, there's a little vagina talk, I will take good care of you, okay? <laughs> I have this picture of an ex-boyfriend, he's doing this, he's showing where it feels good for a girl inside of her. I remember when he was saying it, we were all in our early 20s, this close group of college friends, the ex-boyfriend is sitting on a blue velvet chair, I've done this to a girl and they like it, he's explaining. I took the picture, a disposable camera, and I love this picture. It's a reminder that although I am not a girl who can let a boy or another girl or another person or myself go inside of me and find that place, at least I am with someone who is founded on another. The healthy, good one who can be with a normal girl and do stuff, he's with me, the one who can't do stuff, because he can't do that to me. It's still wool for me there. It's smooth spaces that I think are supposed to be bumpy, bumpy that should be smooth, pieces that feel like a skinned knee like a never-ending whimper of, please, dear God, stop touching me. As the years passed, I thought that that skinned knee, please, dear God, stop touching me inside, would go away, but that's not how it works. The one feeling isn't ever gone. What happens is in addition. So when I'm moving along my love map and making out with someone, and I enter that, oh, this is going to be delicious territory, just after that is a very sudden no inside of me. So uh, the town of fuck yes and the town of fuck no are neighboring communities. This is where that in addition shows up. See, it used to be when I'd enter the fuck no town in vagina land, I'd snap all the way back up. I'd just turn that car around. But now, your therapy dollars at work, I feel the please God stop touching me and I keep going. I drive through that they are going to kill you. I check it out because I know there's more to it. I don't buy anything from the towns of fuck no and they will kill you. I question the values in the town of get off of me, but I do not deny its existence. It's a pain to take heed of every village inside, but there is stuff of value in each. In the wild wilds of please God stop touching me lives my pleasure. She might have been born there. And she's always beaming this steady signal to find her. She made a place for herself. She grew vines and built barricades. And when I move across that terrified land without judgment, when I climb through the blocks, my body created the practice of finding her, my, my me, the her that is me before my father and the subsequent echo of father folks unmade me. The creative ways I move close to her is such a privilege. There is such a privilege in pleasure to just feel the wild pulses course through a body unblocked, to let the energy gallop through the nerves with happy abandon. I never take it for granted when I find her. 
See, I, I have to seek. I have to seek. I have to find my pleasure. She doesn't want anyone else to find her. My pleasure can't be given to me like a sexy surprise party from another. Okay? Like even her call to me, this, hey, you come here. You. Because this is my body, not theirs. This is all mine, and I get to do whatever I want in here, and it's safe to be in here, and she is mine. And I remind myself that a thousand times, and I forget a thousand times. I own this land that is my body. My pleasure, she lives on this land, but I also forget to own it, and I forget to allow myself to enjoy what is in here. Because for long periods of time, I was told what was in here was not mine. And all of us have felt that. I hope you don't feel it right now. This is just my version. My father's flag is planted in me. I feel it still, and I don't know if I can make it go away. Because I guess that's what I need to do eventually. I need to pull the flag he stuck inside of me out. I'm not his. I never was his. But when someone gets up in there and, and moves you in ways you don't understand, it's like being tricked that I'm a puppet. And it spins around in my head equations that make so much sense, maybe only to me, but I can show my work. E equals because he touched me and I came, I can't come if someone touches me because I am not a puppet. Here's another one. Because he touched me and I am not a puppet, I'm bisexual. I worked that one out. It doesn't make sense. See, I was not pining for Joni and Oscar and, and Miss Holler because of my father. It was because of the way they laugh and smile and smell. I was thinking about rolling around naked with them while I was in elementary school because of my father. My father, who might not be my actual father, because according to my mom and sister and anyone else who had the pleasure of knowing my boisterous, strange, theatrical father, my father did not do things like flag plant. My dad isn't a pedophile because he did it when he was bored and drunk and mad, and I was the only one there. And he didn't probably do that much or get that mad. And it's me who makes it all as big as it is. It's me who writes stories and makes her living with her big feelings. And it's so like a girl to get all hyperbolic about sexual abuse, isn't it? It's just like a girl to not pay attention to the good stuff. That one time he helped me take those pictures for class. That one time he took me to the clothing store. That one time he took me to the opera and everybody looked at me funny. I'm not his girlfriend. I know I look like I'm barely 17. I'm barely 12. And strangers can feel it. Strangers are the only ones who can see that flag, see what's happening. And they give me looks. They let me know that I'm part of the problem with my big earnest eyes and my carb fat breasts and a slouch of apology for them seeing me like this. Not like the other sweet 12-year-old girls who didn't make someone plant a flag in them. But you just keep growing. And onward I grew, and onward I grew, and so did my love map. My love map grew around the places he stuck inside of me. I've taught myself to come based on force and violence and fantasies of someone dominating me. And look, that's great for other people to come like that, but not for me, because I tell myself I'm doing that a result of his flag. I read books about sex trauma, these win women transcending it all, just like coming from dreaming of the color blue. I watch Instagram stories of tantric leaders, gorgeous women with subtle nose jobs and rhinestones glued to their forehead with fresh burning man sand in their hair, talking about how we have to be present when we come because a real sex witch, a real sex witch would never use a vibrator, whatever. A good witch likes a lot of glass jars, which I have plenty of, and frogs, and it's called a magic wand for fuck's sake. My ever-growing love map is really weird and it attracts people I am into to bang it out with me and in the middle of it is this big old fucking stick with a big tattered fabric thing property of what's his name and it's just there. And if I rip it out, what do I take with it? I don't identify as a victim of incest. I identify as a woman with some property flags inside of her. Flags I didn't give permission to plant, but planted they are. And the workarounds that I've created, the paths I've taken in spite, are so dear to me. I will not pull that flag out. Somewhere in time, there's a little one. And that flag just got planted. And she's hemorrhaging that little broken heart from that fresh pierce. And I keep this now picture of the flag and future alive for her. Because look, it's not raw here. It's green with bees and flowers and stuck in the middle, if you look really close, is an old stick that was killing her. I have created so much growth around that flag. Every day it folds in on itself more and more. And now it's been so long and there's so much garden of just me. No, I don't pull it out. But I point at the flag a lot. 
acknowledging it was put there is when I feel that flag falter. And sometimes the loosening and the soil is so great. And in addition, it is terrible because my, my terrified villages did not vote for this. The laws of my terrible places still say if I relax and with abandon give someone full agency to get exactly on top of my clit and not sneak up on it like a sexy detective, I will perish. I know if this flag loosens and I am, I am left without it and I am present and aware when someone touches me, I will explode into a dust made of my bones. There are forever might be centimeters to me that feel like they're the size of cities, cities that hold feelings that are too much. I'm afraid that the flag kills me and that if I let the flag go, the hole will leak all of me out. So I speak of it. I write it down. I don't talk about it to lie to ruin my family, to be special. I talk about it so I don't die before I'm dead. I talk about it because I hope the more I say, the more that fear layer slowly sloughs off of me and I become a person who can pop a finger into her cooch and dig around in my G-spot and wonder and see if it feels good or, or see if, if someday some emo pimple I've stored in there since the 70s pops and some glorious trauma honey comes oozing out and it pours onto the floor mixed with old tires and family circus cartoons and and flag fabric and it pours and pours and pours and makes a river of trauma honey and I may cry but I won't drown and it'll be out and I can see what's there this honey that is mine that I made with what happened under that just me and my g-spot and my clit and my mine 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 my parts it's my land and nobody else's flag Wow, 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 wow. Thank you all um, for the brave writing. So, you know, I have to give a shout out too for unpublished work. Reading that is, that's, that's, uh, that's good stuff. That's real good stuff. I'm gonna close with a poem. Thank you all for being here. True pleasure. This poem is called This Living. It's going to be a lunar eclipse. Is going to be critically acclaimed and win none of the awards. It's going to start as an argument over what's buried inside the tomb, but end in silence over what's discovered beneath it. It's going to happen on your birthday, in front of the mailman while you're receiving the letter for your sister sent by her murderer. It's going to appear once a week in your backyard for decades without ever speaking. It's going to ruin the cake when you throw an urn full of cat ashes in your ex-best friend's face at her baby shower. Fucking do it. It's going to make you get under the table and drink there. It's going to explode right there in the dairy aisle. It's going to make you laugh. It's going to remind you why you can't go in mosh pits anymore. It's going to freeze to death right there in your arms. It's going to make all the kids stare out the school bus window and sing to you. It's going to rain where he is. It's going to be impossible for you not to flood. It's going to hurt for a while. It's going to have to. It's going to make you buy all the scarves in his girlfriend's favorite patterns. It's going to happen in the wind during the middle of fire season while he's telling you it's going to have to end soon. It's going to be hard to end soon. It's going to outlast television. It's going to wipe out your entire wild life. It's going to be remembered fondly, your heart unable to keep its hands to itself. It's going to be a lot, but never enough. It's going to be a strong love, but only parallel his lover, never perpendicular her. It's going to affect the whole neighborhood inside you. It's going to make you unable to quell the bad thoughts of his dainty gull and her inkless quill. It's going to bring out the best of the worst in you. It's going to hurt him, what you could write about her. It's going to hurt what you could write what you want. 
It's going to take the shape of poems left under the doormats of retired generals. It's going to happen any day now. It's going to be so good if it doesn't kill us first. With the way things are going, it's probably going to kill us first. It's going to be a nightmare when the Pope gets here. It's going to change everything. It's going to make your metaphors make you even if you don't want to. It's going to sound like coyotes killing behind your back. It's going to ride like a horse's ghost. It's going to cost you. It's going to be familiar. A truck driver humming Schubert. It's going to have to be removed by a doctor. It's going to go in the wrong direction. It's going to go in too much detail. It's going to use your daughter against you. It's going to make you eat everything on all the plates at all the hours. It's going to fill you with sorrow. It's going to fill you with relief. It's going to show you how you got here. It's going to say something cliche like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to hit any minute now. It's going to leave you speechless. It's something you're going to have to carry for the rest of your life. It's going to get dark soon. It's going to feel like it just happened yesterday. It's going to sit well with no one. It's going to be worth it. It's going to build you back up. It's going to get better every day. It's never going to give up. It's going to have your name on it. This living, it's going to belong to you. Thank you so much. Thank you to our incredible readers, Gabrielle Bolat, R.O. Kwan, Nafisa Thompson Spires, Kirsten Vangsness, and thank you all so much for being here by Feminist Books.